thanks everybody. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about adapting uh, Kubernetes for machine learning workflows. Um, and just a quick note about the dream team here. Uh, so Keith and I are both senior software engineers at, at Bloomberg, and we have about combined 15 years of tenure there. Uh, so on a daily basis, we work on the same uh, internal machine learning platform, uh, but we do sit in two different parts of the engineering um, uh, department, which kind of is, in, encourages a healthy balance between uh, the minds of compute uh, researchers and the minds of kind of AI researchers, or it's, at least it's supposed to. Um, and a shameless plug, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about what we do in data science, you can take a look at our blog for things about you know the kinds of public Applications that we have or kind of contributions we have in open source. Cool, so our outline for today, uh, first we'll take a look at our ecosystem at Bloomberg and what kinds of data and applications we have available to us. And then I'll turn it over to Keith who will tell you a little bit more about uh, how we've adapted Kubernetes to solve the kind of challenges that we have with machine learning in these kinds of applications. So, um, right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, machine learning at Bloomberg and what kinds of data and things we have to work with. So to, um, in our clients' daily workflows, uh, message and communication tools are a key part of the spread of information within the industry. And you can see this really with this volume of, uh, of messaging and communication data that's increased over the past 10 year time frame or so. And this volume of information has increased uh, and become so untenable, in fact, that every part of the trading workflow, from portfolio selection to risk analysis to uh, strategy development and really execution, has been automated somewhere by someone using machine learning in the past like two or three years or so. So the markets are really getting much more efficient and time to price with this new information, and it's getting shorter due to automation. So one such kind of automation you might think about is in reaction to events. So if you make the assumption uh, events move financial instruments, then our questions really become, uh, how do I figure out which events move which financial instruments, and how do I figure out the occurrence of such events of interest? So here we have a timeline of an SEC announcement back in like 2010 or so, and they published it on their website, um, which was really unusual at the time, and people weren't really looking at it. I think they look at it a little bit more today. Uh, but suffice to say, um, it was a little bit unusual, and this price reaction here uh, by the Bloomberg headline was really precipitated by the Bloomberg headline. And so all they really did was they re-announced that this, uh, the SEC was, um, had a lawsuit of sorts. Uh, the New York Times is in this picture only to show that um, commodity news, or news that most people see, rarely if ever actually impacts uh, the price of stock prices because it's typically you know, minutes or days or hours late, things like that. So the next slide. Uh, so this actually happened in a slightly more modern take. Um, you know, the impact of social media is a, is a wonderful cesspool of rumors and the potential for gaining a, a big advantage in the market. Uh, somebody, um, you know, mistakenly tweeted on the AP that the Barack Obama was injured and then the, the markets really reacted really quickly. And if you're having a little bit of deja vu over the past couple of slides, you know, maybe something rings a bell with Elon Musk over the past couple of weeks or so. So for Bloomberg, uh, being a you know, financial news company at the center of the industry, um, our entire business is really contingent on the ability to create these applications that are really um, you know, scalable, uh, smarter, really focused, and you know, correct for, for our customers. And I've hinted at a little bit of it so far, um, but you know, just as for our users, this really means taking advantage of sort of automation wherever possible. And here are a couple different examples. You know, we have the, the news applications as well as you know, the ability to extract events that are happening externally or in the industry, increasing relevancy of results, um, and so on and so forth. Cool, so clearly there's an enormous scope uh, for machine learning and a wealth of data at Bloomberg, um, but let's take stock and kind of dive in of the requirements that it might take to support some sort of a life cycle for like a machine learning model or to develop some sort of machine learning based software. So machine learning based systems are developed in what I see is quite a challenging uh, situation at Bloomberg or you know, elsewhere in a large enterprise. And this really comes from, um, and these, these challenges are really driven by the different priorities for our different stakeholders. So first and foremost, uh, you know, for our customers, we really value privacy and uptime and stability for the service that we provide via the Bloomberg professional terminal. And there's really little room for error and really little room for A-B testing as well. From an engineering standpoint, you know, we'd really like to uh, support these customers as well as possible. And this really means having the ability to you know, seamlessly scale, uh, the less operational burden, you know, the, fewer, the, fewer, um, the less room for, for making manual mistakes, the better. And the ability to kind of work within, within a team and share ideas is really great as well. And so for the ML practitioners that sit within the engineering department, this really is only exacerbated. I really want to, um, this is really crucial because the less time that we spend building infrastructure, the more time you can spend really um, you know, looking at the, the latest research or evaluating ideas that you've seen at conference and so on and so forth. 
So let's say that a, a product manager comes up to you and you'd like to, uh, you know, they posit a new feature for one of these applications or they have a new idea for an application. So these are the kinds of problems that you'd really, you know, like to be uh, focusing your time on if you're tasked with one of these, uh, with one of these solutions that you have to, to develop. So what does your, your data look like? What kind of features can you glean from your data? Um, what kinds of algorithms are best suited for this problem? Uh, what kinds of parameters can I tweak? Um, and once I've deployed an application, when is it really appropriate to uh, update my model so that it still accurately reflects um, the kinds of data that I trained it on when I was in development? So you might notice here that there's an implicit assumption that you know, all of the infrastructure that you need is readily available for you to use. Um, but that's not always the case, and some of these questions are much you know, more difficult to answer than others. So sometimes we hit some stumbling blocks along the way, um, and some things are more difficult than others, right? So in a large enough company, uh, data ownership and access can be you know, fairly difficult or become quite complicated. Um, and hopefully you've mastered some sort of transferable skills by using open source toolkits such as Scikit or TensorFlow or Jupyter, things like that. But it's not always the easiest to kind of install and become operational, you know, develop, depending on your, um, the maturity of your development environment. Um, and compute power is not, not completely unlimited, uh, so sometimes you have to schedule these workflows in a sane way and not really you know, annoy your neighbor too much. So from an infrastructure perspective, these are the questions that you'd really like to avoid having to answer, but too often these are the things that kind of wait, take way too much time that you spend uh, you know, building up, and ultimately the efficiency of your workflows and the accuracy of your models really depends on the, uh, the infrastructure that you have and the tools that you have available. So once you settle and occasionally compromise on some workflow for the problem that you're working on, uh, you go into what I refer to as the machine learning model development lifecycle. And it looks a little bit like this. It's a big infinite loop. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have what we refer to as kind of the training process or this offline procedure. Uh, and then the right side, we have you know, our online process or you know, what's serving actually predictions. So on the left, again, we kind of have our task. We define our business problem. We gather a bunch of data. We run training processes over a model, you know, maybe some neural networks, maybe some sort of scikit models. We evaluate it. We go kind of in an infinite loop on the left-hand side until you, you know, exhaust and repeat your resources, and maybe at some point you kind of hit your melting capacity or you hit a deadline and you have to go and actually publish something for production. So when it's good enough, you go to the right-hand side, and then you publish something, you release it in some sort of constrained manner, you monitor it um, until it's time to go to the left-hand side to iterate on some new ideas or kind of reevaluate your uh, task at hand. So the question is, how do we really enable uh, the researchers to really focus on those how questions, the why questions earlier, not on the how questions that take way too much time? So uh, I leave you with some ideas here. Uh, and this is the part where I kind of kick it over to Keith to tell you how we've adapted Kubernetes to achieve this kind of nirvana for these uh, problems. Thanks, Tanya. Am I on? OK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes uh, from sort of a high level and uh, talk about why we thought it was a really good fit for the machine learning problems that Anya sort of brought up here. Uh, but just to give you some background on this, um, we started this project like two and a half, three years ago, before it was really common in the community to be running machine learning uh, on Kubernetes, the way that you sort of see uh, a bunch of ideas in the community sort of converging right now. So it's, it's been cool to follow along and and see how everyone is sort of interpreting uh, this uh, sort of uh, solution. So let's start with uh, the obligatory what is Kubernetes website quote. Uh, Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. Maybe you've seen this before. Maybe you're familiar with it. Um, but if you're not, what I want you to take away from this is that Kubernetes is really good at letting application developers work on their applications and then allowing them to deploy uh, their software without having to think about infrastructure by putting them into their application into sort of a container or like a zipped application which they can sort of ship into the cloud. So from a really high level, uh, your usage with Kubernetes might look something like this. You have a user, um, we'll call her Katie, uh, and she wants to submit some API resource um, into Kubernetes. So she does this using um, kubectl, which is like the command line interface. And that goes to the API server. And then in the background, there's this thing called a controller, which watches for the creation of these resource types um, or updates to these resource types. And it sort of kicks off this life cycle. And the controller 
uh, basically says, what is the new desired state of the world? Let me compare this to the current state of the world and then uh, reconcile this by sending a list of updates back to the, the API server. And actually, in the real world, there's many controllers that work on different types of resources in the Kubernetes um, ecosystem. And eventually, a pod is going to get created in Kubernetes, and the pod is sort of the lowest level thing that can get created, uh, which will run on a server. And the pod contains the container, which should be running. And the API server will schedule this pod onto a node or a server for you. So let's look really quick at a core Kubernetes type um, in this YAML format. This is a deployment for running your application uh, in Kubernetes, and it's sort of an always up type of deployment. So first, um, we'll look at the type meta. This is just sort of defining the namespace and the kind of this YAML that we're looking at. Next is the specification, um, and that's sort of the properties of the deployment. Here we're saying we want a replication factor of three, and what we want replicated is this pod template or pod spec template of some version of Nginx, and that'll be replicated three times. So what's really happening here is when we create this YAML, there's a controller in the background that reacts to the creation of this and says, okay, I see that there should be three pods, and it goes, creates three pods and makes sure that they're all there. So inherently, YAML is declarative and reproducible and human readable, which is great. And it also gives us a bunch of benefits of Kubernetes, right? Uh, like hardware indifference, the application developer didn't need to think about what server it was running on. Um, the API server just kind of scheduled it for you. You get free monitoring for like CPU and uh, memory metrics from Docker and, and Kubernetes. And if you add other open source software like uh, Prometheus, you can get application metrics. You get replication, so like guaranteed uptime from that replication number. With the minimal amount of work, you can add auto-scaling. And through other um, open source libraries like Istio, you can add like service mesh uh, for service-to-service -service, uh, security. So right, I haven't really talked about machine learning at all. I've just talked about some benefits of Kubernetes. So wouldn't it be really cool if we can marry these two properties together and make something that speaks ML, but also takes advantage of all the good of Kubernetes. So we've done this with something called custom resources, which is built into Kubernetes. Uh, and I think uh, earlier it was called third-party resources. Now it's called custom resources, if, you're, if you've heard of that before. And when I say resource, I basically uh, mean what I've been talking about, deployments, pods, these like core API objects in Kubernetes. And a custom resource is just an extension to that, which is a user-defined resource type, usually with a corresponding controller that does all the magic in the background. So let's look at one of the types that we've created in Bloomberg uh, for TensorFlow, which has been a really popular toolkit for ML pr practi practitioners. So first is our type meta. And you can see here that we're now in the Bloomberg DS namespace, because this is no longer a Kubernetes native uh, object, but it does work in much the same way as any other Kubernetes object would work. Uh, this next part is also using some built-in uh, Kubernetes uh, metadata, which is available on all your types of objects, which are annotations. So if you're scheduling a bunch of jobs together, you might be working on a project or an experiment, and you want to put some labels on it so you can basically throw this in the top for when you're referring back to it later. Now, more importantly, is the specification for this TensorFlow job. Uh, we've sort of abstracted away the concept of containers for everybody uh, because you get into a whole world of craziness sometimes. So if you want to use TensorFlow, you choose our TensorFlow 1.7 framework, which makes sure that we have all the right binaries and GPU drivers and everything you can possibly need. Um, for uh, data access, we've found that um, having to set up your key tabs for security in HDFS or your config files for um, sort of the Hadoop ecosystem could be difficult um, and managing all of that. So we've added first class data citizenship to our types and you can specify this through this identity type. 
and we make sure all your secrets and config maps will be mounted into your running pod. Uh, now, because you're not creating containers anymore, you need some way to specify your runtime dependencies and your entry points, so you can do it like this. Um, and the size parameter, I think, is kind of neat because instead of setting specific requests for CPU and memory, you can now set sort of like a t-shirt size of small, medium, or large, and with a flip of a switch, uh, switch it to GPU. So maybe you were running some tests with this YAML in, on CPUs, but now you want to run it for real on your GPU, so you just change it from like small to GPU large, and that's the only thing you need to change, and it's often scheduled on some uh, specialized hardware. Uh, and this last bit is just the arguments that get passed into the application. You can see the user here is intending to use HDFS um, and their Hadoop identity, which we uh, talked about earlier. So just to bring back um, sort of the fundamental pieces we wanted for solving this machine learning problem, um, by adding this sort of size parameter and owning the containers, uh, we can build these fundamental building blocks that give people easy access to specialized hardware like GPUs, uh, adding first class data citizenship to our YAML types um, makes data much more liquid um, and easier to get at. The declarative nature of Kubernetes and encapsulating it all in the driver makes people's development experience a little bit easier and most importantly, with the custom resources, we can speak specifically ML in Kubernetes. And we've extended this for a couple of other um, types in Bloomberg, um, mainly Spark for distributed ETL, more generally for Python if you're using something like PyTorch or Scikit-Learn, uh, same thing for JVM-based runtimes, uh, and if you need something interactive, we have support for Jupyter, and we also have a whole separate operator for black box hyperparameter tuning on these other types of jobs. So just to wrap it up, um, at Bloomberg, we have this huge amount of data, and we've needed machine learning for this data. So it's been a great opportunity uh, to leverage machine learning. But to do this efficiently, we really need our ML practitioners to think about ML and not have to think about infrastructure. And we do this by introducing Kubernetes, which allow the infrastructure folk to think about infrastructure. So. Thanks for keeping this community strong and being involved in open source. And if you have more questions, my manager um, and head of data and analytics at Bloomberg will be on a panel with some others tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock.